and oh do you want to yes let's start recording All right okay so welcome everyone um, we are joined firstly by dr c dyson and she sorry i'm admitting people I'll, from I'll, the look me. I'll do the okay um, you do that if you want anything. so Dr. C. Dyson um, qualified as a vet from the University of Cambridge, um, and I was very lucky to be a colleague of hers at the Animal Health Trust, um, which sadly has very sadly closed down now, but I thought I was there for a long time, seven years, but um, Sue was there for 37 years and basically built up the equine referral clinic there, um, um, looking mainly at lameness and poor performance issues in horses. Um, and she did this sort of working on national and international cases. Um, currently, she's working as an independent consultant. She's a specialist in equine orthopedics, thus we wanted to get her to talk to us about sort of the impact of extra weight on joints um, and on the performance of the horse, uh, veterinary sports medicine and rehabilitation. And she's published over 300 papers in peer-reviewed journals about lameness and diagnostic imaging, lectured all over the world, um, done loads of talks for vets, farriers, um, owners. So we are very, very happy to have Sue join us tonight. So I will stop sharing my screen um, and I will ask Sue to go ahead and share hers and um, leave it over to you, Sue. Well, it's a real pleasure to talk to everybody tonight. I think I've got a fairly controversial presentation because this is a subject I feel passionately about. And I think that we are seeing an increasing number of obese horses. And as a result of that, an increasing number of problems directly related to that. So what I want to discuss briefly is what is obesity? What are the potential problems for an obese horse? Is the prevalence of obesity getting worse? And if so, why? And what can we do about it? So what is obesity? I would go as far as to say that this is a silent torturer because excess body fat accumulation has a potentially extremely negative impact on the health and welfare of horses. What does this mean in practical terms and how can we assess obesity? Well, our best method of assessment is by body condition score, which basically asks how discernible are the bony landmarks by both visual inspection and palpation. I'm showing two extremes here. On, gray, uh, on the left, we obviously have an extremely poor horse with a body condition score of grade one out of nine. And on the right, we have what I too commonly see, a horse with a grade seven out of nine. And seven out of nine, for me, is an excessively fat horse. And I believe that this is being, beginning to be seen as what is normal for horses. And this is, to me, a very major problem for equine welfare. So with a fat horse, we have excess fat deposits, often characterized by a cresty neck appearance, as we see in both of these dressage horses. These horses were conceived by their owners to be in good bodily condition. And that is not the case. These horses are excessively fat and they had problems as a direct consequence of this. I am amazed by the fact that some of my clients misinterpret the fatty deposits as swellings reflecting muscle injury. So they will describe to me that my horse has these lumps around the back of the croup, uh, which they say are muscle problems, despite the fact that they're bilaterally symmetrical. Or they say my horse has developed fatty lumps behind the shoulder. That must be abnormal. 
Well, yes, it's abnormal, but it reflects fat. It's not a muscular problem, it's a fat problem. Now, obviously, there are some key factors that influence obesity, those being food energy intake and the energy expenditure. And the energy expenditure is the result of physical activity and thermoregulation, that is, um, um, modulating the body temperature. And there is also a genetic susceptibility to the development of being fat. And this is another fat individual. So what are the potential musculoskeletal problems that can occur in an obese horse? Well, there are a multitude, unfortunately. There is equine metabolic syndrome, which results in a predisposition for classical laminitis and subclinical laminitis. And one of my focuses this evening is going to be talking more about subclinical or atypical laminitis. And these horses with subclinical laminitis, I believe, have an increased risk of what is sometimes absolutely catastrophic laminitis, life-threatening laminitis, which is induced by the use of corticosteroids for treatment of an unrelated condition. I believe that the overweight athlete has a reduced efficiency of athletic function. And clearly any increased load on the limbs is of particular relevance in horses with pre-existing musculoskeletal injury and is going to predispose to musculoskeletal injury. I'm going to present to you some evidence of increased risk of suspensory ligament injury in overweight horses. And the obese horse is going to have impaired thermoregulation, and this is going to influence its performance and predispose to premature fatigue and thus predispose to musculoskeletal injury. So equine metabolic syndrome in simplistic terms, is an altered sensitivity to insulin, which has some similarities to diabetes type 2 in obese people. And this results in a predisposition for laminitis. And on the right, we see a typical posture of a pony with classical laminitis, with the hind limbs camped underneath the body and the forelimbs extended. But it also predisposes to subclinical laminitis. And this is, I think, a condition which has been under-recognized, not only within the horse-owning public, 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 but also within the veterinary profession. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the anatomy of the horse's foot and some aspects of that that we can appreciate using x-rays. So on the left, we've got a section through the foot. So this is the distal phalanx or pedal bone. And these are the laminar structures that support the pedal bone within the hoof capsule. So we have the hoof wall, which is relatively opaque, which we see in this part of the foot on the x-ray. And then we have the area of the laminar tissues and the sublamellar dermis, which is occupied by this tissue represented by the yellow double-headed arrow. And in this high quality radiograph, we can see a distinct line between the hoof wall and the lamella tissues. And we can see around the, the distal phalanx or the pedal bone, we've got this relatively thin black area. And this is a normal foot. In order to look at the thickness of the tissues on the front of the pedal bone or the dorsal aspect of the pedal bone, we can measure the distance between the outer layer of the hoof wall 
and the distal phalanx or the pedal bone. And this is called the hoof distal phalanx distance. Now with radiographs, we have the potential for there to be some degree of magnification and that magnification will vary depending upon the size of the horse's foot and also the position of the imaging plate relative to the horse's foot. So in order to compare among different horses, we need to look at a ratio of measurements. And so we can look at the distance between the dorsal hoof wall and the distal phalanx. And what we call the within the bit of bone. And in a normal horse, the ratio between the hoof distal phalanx distance and the palmar length of the distal phalanx is 0 0.25. And in the image on the right, this is an example of a normal horse when the ratio between this distance, the hoof distal phalanx distance, and the palmar length of the distal phalanx is 0 0.25. Whereas in this example on the left, this ratio is 0 0.28. So that is an abnormally high ratio reflecting thickening of these tissues. And the tissues thicken because this part, the lamina structure, becomes thickened. So why is this hoof distal phalanx distance potentially important? It's because in some forms of laminatus, there may be relatively low grade stretching of the lamellae without rotation of the distal phalanx, which is what we see in classic laminitis. With this increase in the hoof distal phalanx distance, with or without changes in the opacity of this tissue or the grayness of the tissue, we may see alterations in the opacity of this tissue. So this is another example when this distance the hoof distal phalanx distance to the, uh, to the palmar length of the distal phalanx ratio is become enlarged, and this has a ratio of 0.3. Remember, the normal is 0.25. And in this horse, we can actually see this is the line that defines the hoof wall from the lamella tissues. This line should, in a normal horse, be parallel to the dorsal border or the front border of the pedal bone. But we can see that these are not parallel because we've got a wedge of abnormal tissue here. Without drawing this line and comparing it with the um, front border of the distal phalanx, you perhaps would not appreciate that in fact there is a very low grade rotation of the distal phalanx because of the development of abnormal thickness of the lamella tissues here compared with here. So with a typical laminitis, in contrast to horses with typical laminitis, there is no palpable increase in the digital pulse amplitudes. Most of these horses show no reaction to hoof testers, whereas the horse with classical laminitis usually will show a markedly positive response to hoof testers applied around the toe of the hoof. These horses stand in a normal posture. However, they do have low grade chronic foot pain associated with lamellar pathology, which is characterized by lengthening of the lamellae and thus increase in this ratio between the dorsal hoof wall distance and the palmar length of the distal phalanx. Also, in contrast to some horses with laminitis, the rings around the hoof capsule remain in parallel alignment, whereas in many horses with classical laminitis, the hoof rings begin to diverge in the heel region. 
This is a scintigraphic image or a bone, a bone scan image of this same horse. And we can see we've got increased radiopharmaceutical uptake or hotspots around the periphery of the distal phalanx. This is the foot standing on the gamma camera, which reflects the abnormal stress that there is in the lamellar attachments to the distal phalanx. So these are three horses which had atypical laminitis. We can see that they are all abnormally obese animals. These two on the left have excessive cresty neck appearances. There is abnormal fat deposition behind the shoulder blades, which we also see in this horse here. This is a less extreme example to represent to you that this horse is in what I would say is typical show horse condition. This was a horse shown as a riding horse, a lightweight riding horse, but it's not a lightweight riding horse. It's an obese riding horse. And this is the pony that we've already seen in which its hoof distal phalanx ratio to the palmar length of the distal phalanx was 0 0.34. Remember, the normal is 0 0.25. So this pony had a pottery forelimb gait. Most of these horses do not show overt unilateral lameness. They show a shortening of the forelimb step length. They are worse on firm ground compared with hard ground. They frequently turn in an uncomfortable fashion. If you look at the solar surface of the foot of some, but not all of these horses, the solar surface will have lost some of its concavity, as we see in this pony here. This horse with the abnormally cresty neck appearance and fat deposits behind the shoulder blades and around the tail head has additional features. We can see that not only is there increased thickness of the dorsal hoof wall, it is thicker close to the, to the toe than it is in the upper part of the foot in both feet, but worse in this, the left front foot. But we can also see some abnormalities of shape of the distal phalanx because we have this slipper-like appearance at the toe of the distal phalanx which reflects chronic remodeling of the toe of the distal phalanx, which tells me that this horse has had chronic laminar pathology for some time, because this is what we call a secondary modeling change. We performed a study in evaluating the x-ray appearance of the front feet of 279 horses which had undergone examination at the Animal Health Trust. And we examined radiographs or x-rays of 415 feet of these 279 horses. The majority of the horses had undergone x-rays of the feet, x-ray examination of the feet, because they had foot-related pain, but some of them were undergoing pre-purchase examinations. When we looked at the proportion of horses which had modelling of the toe of the distal phalanx, as we see here, there were 23% of all feet which had modelling of the toe of the distal phalanx. There was a significantly higher proportion of horses which had a hoof distal phalanx distance ratio with the palmar length of the distal phalanx, which exceeded the normal of 0 0.25, which had this modeling of the toe of the distal phalanx compared with horses with a normal ratio. Again, supporting the fact that this modeling of the toe of the distal phalanx is seen in association with increased thickness of the dorsal hoof wall, reflecting chronic 
laminar pathology, the results of effectively chronic laminitis. In these horses, these are all lateral medial images of the front feet, we can see new bone formation midway between the top and the bottom of the bone of the distal phalanx. This new bone formation represents abnormal stress at the laminar attachments. Sometimes we see it on the front of the bone and sometimes we see it on the front and the side of the bone. In this study of more than 200 horses, we only had lateromedial images to investigate the presence of this new bone formation. But nonetheless, we saw this new bone formation much more commonly in horses with an abnormal ratio, that is a ratio greater than 0 0.25, and those horses with a ratio of 0 0.25 or less. Because not all horses had oblique images, we couldn't assess uh, accurately how frequently new bone formation was seen in oblique images. So we may have underestimated the frequency of occurrence of this new bone formation. But we believe that this new bone formation is also a reflection of chronic strain at the laminar attachments of the distal phalanx as a result of this atypical often subclinical laminitis seen in obese horses. So this new bone formation reflects abnormal stress of the attachment of the suspensory apparatus of the distal phalanx. We don't fully understand why it seems to be restricted to this middle one third of the distal phalanx, but that's where it does occur. In this study, we looked at the relationship between the hoof distal phalanx distance ratio and the height to body weight ratio. And the smaller the height to body weight ratio was, that is the more obese horses, the larger the hoof distal phalanx distance ratio was likely to be. We know from previous studies that overweight horses may be at a higher risk of equine metabolic syndrome and thus laminitis. Although in a relatively recent prospective study of pasture associated laminitis, obesity was not a significant factor in the final statistical model. In our study, cobs had a significantly larger hoof distal phalanx distance ratio compared with the warm bloods, suggesting a greater likelihood of chronic lamellar pathology in crops compared with warm bloods. And in a recent British survey carried out by Robin et al, cob types did have an increased risk of obesity compared with thoroughbreds. So the results of our study suggest that subclinical laminitis may be more prevalent than previously recognized. There has been some work done on um, looking at the lamella tissues under the microscope, that's using what we call histology. And there is evidence that the histopathological abnormalities were more chronic than was consistent with the recognized duration of clinical signs. And I think this is because these horses were undergoing preclinical episodes of laminar pathology, which had gone unrecognized. Now, one of the things I think is really important that we recognize this is because we often treat horses with corticosteroids for a variety of unrelated reasons. Perhaps because the horse has got joint pathology, so this horse has got arthritic change within the pastern joint, or perhaps because the horse has developed cellulitis, which is not believed to be infectious in origin, or perhaps the horse has got chronic lower airway disease and is treated with corticosteroids. If you look at the recent literature 
about the relationship between treatment with corticosteroids and the induction of laminitis, there has been controversial conclusions. And many authors have suggested that there is not substantial evidence that corticosteroids can induce clinical laminitis. But I would question that data because I think there is evidence that those horses with pre-existing subclinical laminitis are probably at a significant risk of developing catastrophic laminitis as a result of treatment with corticosteroids. And this example on the right was just such a case in which we have sinking of the distal phalanx. The entire distal phalanx has sunk within the hoof capsule after this horse had been medicated with corticosteroids for treatment of this joint. This horse finished up being humanely destroyed because once we have sinking of the distal phalanx within the hoof capsule, that is extraordinarily difficult to manage successfully. In 2006, I was involved in a conference in equine sports medicine and science at the University of Cambridge. And I conducted a survey of 36 top ranking European sports horse practitioners. 33% had experienced the development of severe laminitis within seven to 10 days of administration of corticosteroids in a total of 22 horses. A variety of corticosteroids were incriminated, including dexamethasone, triamcinolone, and betamethasone, and they had been administered via a variety of different routes, either intramuscularly, intravenously, or directly into joints, for treatment of a variety of conditions, including recurrent airway obstruction, joint disease, or back pain. All the horses were treated at corticosteroid doses which were considered to be within the normal range. The majority of the treatments, 82% were single treatments, but a unifying factor was that the majority of the horses were considered to be overweight at the time of treatment. And, and this is a devastating statistic, approximately 50% of the affected horses were humanely destroyed due to uncontrollable sinking of the distal phalanges in more than one limb. In 2018, I did an additional survey of 31 experienced equine practitioners from which I had an 81% response rate. And the reason for conducting this survey was because an equine veterinarian owned a horse, which was a show hunter, which had been kept in a professional person's show producer's yard. And this horse was given corticosteroids for a soft tissue swelling that had developed in the brisket region and developed severe laminitis. Coincidentally, there were previous foot x-rays available from this horse, which was, in my view, an obese horse. And I could see from the radiographs, looking at the thickness of the dorsal hoof wall, that this horse had pre-existing subclinical laminitis, which had never been recognized. So from my survey, 19 of the 25 respondents, that's 76%, considered that there was a risk of the development of laminitis following administration of corticosteroids, with many of them highlighting the significance of the presence of, of other risk factors for laminitis, such as equine metabolic syndrome. And 64% of the respondents had personal experience of a horse developing laminitis within seven days of administration of corticosteroids. And in the high proportion of these horses, the outcome of the laminitis was catastrophic for the horse. So I believe in conclusion that 
Obese horses have a high risk of developing subclinical laminitis. And if they have to be treated with corticosteroids for whatever reason, they are also at risk of developing more severe and sometimes catastrophic laminitis. So let's move on now and consider the efficiency of athletic function in an obese horse, such as we see on the right here. So a 50 kilogram horse, a, a horse which is 550 kilograms, which is 50 kilograms overweight, is effectively carrying an extra 9% of its body weight. And this will actually be more than carrying me because I'm only 43 kilograms. And excess body weight results in premature fatigue, which I believe can predispose to musculoskeletal injury. And we have plenty of evidence to support this. If the horse already has, for example, pre-existing osteoarthritis of the fetlock joint, as this horse has here, characterized by this periarticular new bone formation around the front and the top of the long paston bone. If this horse is overloaded, it's more likely to have recurrent pain associated with this joint, and it may result in this joint disease becoming progressively worse. In a survey that we conducted in 2014, of 506 sports horses, which were considered by their owners to be normal and in full work, 47% of them actually demonstrated lameness or gait abnormalities in canter that we believe are related to pain. And of these 506 horses, the body condition score out of a total of nine, 10% had a body condition score between seven and nine. So 10% of these 506 sports horses were at risk of having overloading of their joints and the soft tissue structures of the limbs. And that I believe is a staggeringly high proportion. We recently performed a study where we were looking at the occurrence of and risk factors for suspensory ligament branch injuries in horses with hind limb proximal suspensory desmopathy. So these were horses with upper suspensory ligament problems in the hind limbs and which also had either concurrent branch injuries in the hind limbs or the forelimbs or concurrent forelimb proximal suspensory desmopathy. And we had a total of 923 horses which had hind limb proximal suspensory desmopathy. And we found that body weight to height ratio, which is a good indicator of body condition score, was a significant risk factor for either concurrent suspensory ligament injury or suspensory branch injury in any limb. So, compare, so these horses had more than two times the odds of having concurrent branch injuries or concurrent forelimb suspensory ligament injury. And we had not expected this result. This was an unexpected result and was really rather a shocking result. We know that the body weight to height ratio and body condition score are correlated. We know that we are seeing a progressive increase in body condition score in sports and leisure horses. The very fact that the horse is overweight is going to result in increased load on the suspensory apparatus, which may be a predisposing factor for injury. And there is also an increasing body of evidence that obesity can result in altered metabolic pathways that can also predispose to musculoskeletal injury. We also know that fat acts as a very effective insulator. So obesity results in decreased efficiency of heat loss. 
Overheating in a horse reduces performance and will predispose to premature fatigue. And premature fatigue increases the result of musculoskeletal injury. So yet another reason why we should avoid having obese horses. I think it's very notable that you don't see obese racehorses or elite endurance horses or elite event horses or professional polo ponies. And we've lost sight of the fact that these are normal individuals. These horses have an, a normal body condition score. So is the prevalence of obesity getting worse? And if so, why? All the photographs I've showed to you this evening have all been of horses presented to me for clinical investigation, none of which were considered, unfortunately, by their owners to be obese. But clearly, this is yet another obese individual. So who, who is and what is responsible for this potential killer crisis? I believe that owners have misconceptions of what is normal. There is fashion in the show ring and in dressage that horses should be overweight. Food company advertisements, I think, are, is, are misleading. There is an increasing trend for supplementary feeding. In Robin et al's study, 79% of horse, of horse owners gave supplementary feed in the summer which is quite ridiculous. We see an increasing propensity for horses to be rugged all the year round. This was a horse a photograph taken in the DIY yard just round the road, corner from where I live. Horses are increasingly having inadequate exercise. And I think that the human obesity crisis also has a role to play. I believe there is ignorance. This five-year-old Highland pony, only 14 two hands high, had a weight of 550 kilograms and a body condition score of eight. Its daily forage requirement was a total of six kilograms, but it was being fed eight kilograms, two of these large hay nets, twice daily. So I think there's ignorance. So what can we do about this? We need to recognize the problem and its consequences. We need to educate owners and we need to educate trainers and we need to educate judges. We need to realize that this is the normal. This is what we should be able to see, the horse's ribs. This is obese. We need to recognize that a fit, lean horse is a healthy horse. We need to be able to see the definitions of the horse's muscles, unobscured by fat. Food intake should match energy output. Exercise is hugely important. Exercise reduces fat mass, fat mass and increases insulin sensitivity and reduces the risk of obesity. So my conclusions are, obesity is effectively killing with kindness. Laminitis is a welfare issue. Equine metabolic syndrome is a real problem. Atypical laminitis frequently goes unrecognized. We can prevent killing with kindness. Body weight can be controlled, but it requires all parts of the equine industry to be more aware and to act appropriately and to educate proactively. As I've said, the obesity crisis in people, this beginning to be seen as the normal, and our collective failure to control this presents real challenges for human health and equine health. Obesity, I believe, is the silent torturer. Thank you for listening to me, and I hope there'll be lots of questions. Thank you.
so much, Sue. That was really, really informative. Um, so guys, please put your questions in the chat box. Um, we are going to have one more talk now. Um, and then we will go on to our live Q&A and discussion. So please do hang around for that. Thank you once again, Sue. Yeah, thank you. That was amazing. I was just scribbling loads of notes. That was absolutely fascinating. I loved all the x-rays. Thank you, Sue. Um, really interesting to see. Um, okay, so we're now going to move over to um, a Q&A um, with Professor Kathy McGowan, who's head of the um, equine department at the vet school here at University of Liverpool. So that's the Leehurst, um, uh, the Leehurst campus. Some of you may know of it. Um, so this was a Q&A based on questions which people sent into the care page um, a couple of weeks back. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about Kathy. Kathy. Um, so Kathy graduated from the University of Sydney in 1991 um, and she went on study in um, Australia further and since then she's lived um, in England um, and in the UK and um, also studied, um, studied extensively in Australia as well. Um, and um, she, when she was working at the RVC, uh, she developed her interest in aged horses and the endocrine, endocrine diseases um, and started researching equine Cushing syndrome, the PPID, equine metabolic syndrome and endocrinopathic laminitis, um, which she's continued through her various posts. Um, she's a diplomat of the European College of Equine Internal Medicine, which is some of the um, highest um, qualifications you can do, um, and an RCVS recognised specialist in equine internal medicine. And she's currently a professor of equine internal medicine. Um, so she's um, a really well recognised expert um, in this area and has published extensively on laminitis um, and also lots of the really practical things about, um, for example, how long we should soak hay for, which I think Dee and I get asked every single time we do one of these webinars and, you know, those really kind of nitty gritty pro problems that we all need to know about um, day to day. So I hope you um, enjoy this talk and um, as Dee said, please do hang around after, um, after the talk for, um, for questions with Sue um, and yeah, we'll look forward to that. Okay, so I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, do, do, do. Give me one second. Um, hopefully this is going to work. Um, can you now see a awful picture of me and a nice picture of Kathy? Could you just put your thumb on? Yes. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Okay, lovely. Um, okay, so I'll just play that down. Mm -hmm. Oh, hang on. We can't hear anything. Did you do the thing where you um, allow the sound? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, yes. Good point. How do I do that again? Sorry, everyone. Give me one second. Ah. Uh, um, leave computer audio and if you click oh, under the mute it. thing. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I have to reshare my screen. I forgot about doing that. Okay. Sorry. Da, da, da. So when I share the screen. We're not the most technologically minded sorry. people. Yeah. yeah, sorry everyone. Okay, I have to do share computer sound, share sound. Okay, that's good. ST yeah. um, as well as good. the vets of Equine at the Vets. Yeah, good. Um, and is one of the most well respected professionals in the field of equine metabolic syndrome, weight loss, and everything. So we're really lucky to have her talking with us today. Thank you very much. Um, so we've got um, quite a few questions that have been sent in by the community. Um, so to start with, um, it's quite a big question to start with, so sorry about that, but um, could you explain to us what happens in the body when you've got healthy fat and then it turns into a horse with metabolic problems? So what's actually going on there? Okay, so what happens is, uh, so first of all, not all healthy fat will turn into metabolic problems. Okay. So underneath that has to be a genetic predisposition for metabolic syndrome, really. We'll talk about metabolic, metabolic syndrome, equine metabolic syndrome or EMS. Mm -hmm. And in those horses, which unfortunately we know that EMS is actually apparent in about a quarter of all native ponies and cobs, and the predisposition is probably even a lot higher than that. Mm -hmm. So if you've got the genetic predisposition, and then you add the fat to it, then over time, and that can be relatively quick, depending on how much fat there is to add to the equation, mm -hmm. that fat becomes actually endocrinologically active. So it becomes, it starts to produce um, uh, hormones and other factors that actually make it, um, uh, that set up the body to become what we call insulin resistant. Okay. It is, I know it's a very complex system. There's various different ways that it does it. But underneath it all, the animal becomes metabolically abnormal mm -hmm. as a result of that fat driving that metabolic abnormality. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, that's interesting. So, um, so you said it, it relates to a genetic predisposition. So is that why we don't see this so much in certain breeds of horses compared to others? Or? Yes, absolutely. Okay. But you can see it in, in a thoroughbred or, or okay. an Arabs. Oh, actually, I think they do actually have more <laughs> genetic predisposition than we think. You can see it in our classic light bred horses, mm -hmm. but it is more common in our natives. The reason why is they've been bred to be thrifty. So actually, this predisposition to insulin resistance, which we now call insulin dysregulation, which I'll, I'll explain later if I have time, mm -hmm. but um, this predisposition to this metabolic abnormality actually was an, uh, is an advantage mm -hmm. when animals are living on very native pastures in native conditions where they suffer periods of weight loss mm -hmm. and have to gain weight rapidly and store it and have to survive periods of very little for many months of the year. So that's why it's, it's more common in our native breeds. Oh, okay, brilliant. Thank you. Okay. Um, so next question. Um, why does a, f a horse being fat lead to a horse getting labanitis and having an issue in its feet? Yeah. So it's not direct. So as I said, we, as we explained with the previous question, you've got your healthy obese and mm -hmm. you've got your metabolically abnormal obese. Mm -hmm. So it's only the metabolically abnormal obese that will be predisposed to laminitis. Mm -hmm. And the simple answer in one word is insulin insulin causes the laminitis the more complex answer is the fact that this metabolically abnormal fat drives this insulin dysregulation and what that means is it's a type of diabetes when when the animal has normal carbohydrates that they have in their normal forages their grass their hay their hay leaves, or whatever they're eating instead of the body absorbing the carbohydrates and having a normal insulin response and, and insulin drives that energy or the glucose into the cells and, and uses they use that for energy etc the ability for that insulin to work is reduced mm -hmm. and the animal has to produce a lot more insulin in order and that's what the insulin is regular so it produces a, a an increased insulin response and there's also a direct insulin response from the carbohydrates in the food just literally from the gut as well so there's two there's a double whammy that's why we don't just call it insulin resistance it's a mm -hmm. in so as soon as so if you've got a metabolically abnormal horse or pony or donkey, mm -hmm. when it eats carbohydrate, which is literally 40% of the constituent of grass, for example, it eats that carbohydrate, it's going to have a direct insulinemic response. So that means the, the mm -hmm. body produces more insulin and it's also going to have an indirect insulin response because it doesn't put the glucose into the cell, so it needs more insulin to do it. Both of those create high blood insulin High blood insulin causes laminitis. Right, okay. Okay, so there's a definite a direct link the, the insulin to the laminitis. Okay, that's really interesting. Okay, thank you. Um, so next, this kind of follows on from those first two questions. So you, you talked about healthy fats and um, uh, metabolic problems, metabolic fats. Um, how can you tell whether your horse has healthy fat or not? Hmm. Again, simple answer, one, one word, insulin, test for insulin. And there are different ways to test for insulin. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where we can sometimes get put off. In, people, to be fair, we, we know equine metabolic syndrome wasn't even really known about it a decade ago. So we still, we have been learning over the last 10 to 15 years exactly how to diagnose and things. Mm -hmm. And I think from my perspective, the simplest tests are often the best. And we've also got to remember whether or not we want to screen. So mm -hmm. say... For example, you're managing uh, a, a livery yard of, and uh, a show herd of Welsh um, section bees or something. You might want to know which ones of those are going to be more um, problematic during the, the summer pasture period, for example. Mm -hmm. So you could easily screen those animals just with a basal insulin. In the olden days, or you know, five years or so, we would fast the horses before we did it. So everybody didn't want to test for insulin because it was a pain because you had to take away their feed. Now we do not fast them. I mean, obviously we're not going to give them a bucket feed before we mm -hmm. test for it, but if they're on pasture 24 seven, mm -hmm. you don't do anything. If they're on um, a normal uh, hay diet uh, um, or if, if they are on a bucket feed, just have the test either sort of three to four hours after the bucket feed and hay or or before the bucket feed of hay, it's very simple. You don't, we don't fast them anymore. Mm. So that's a very simple test, but it's not a perfect test. 
if we've got a horse where we're worried about laminitis and we really need to get the diagnosis properly, let's say it's had a bout of laminitis or you can see that it has mm. in those sneaky rings that have snuck up before the pain mm. um, and you really want to be 100% sure, then we can do what we call sugar tests or glucose tests. And either we syringe some caro syrup, which horses seem to love, and somehow <laughs> we syringe into the horse's <laughs> mouth or we no give them a, a little bit of chaff with some glucose in it. And that's a little bit more, well, significantly more sensitive and specific mm. and but we know by testing for the insulin either basally after a carbohydrate feed which is what the sugar is carbohydrate is sugar and starch and mm. everything else non-structural carbohydrates in grass or they're all carbohydrates we all know about carbs because we all <laughs> have a couple out of our own diets we do <laughs> yeah. so, so we either measure it basally to see what the animal's doing mm. we stimulate the system by car with carbs so that we can really check how they're responding and remember that's going to stimulate that two parts of the insulin insulin dysregulation that i described before and probably confused you all about but the direct gut one and the insulin resistance one mm -hmm. and then the other thing to do is later on testing can be a lot simpler you only need to do the diagnostic test to be sure the animal is got EMS. Okay. Once the animal has EMS and you want to know how you're going with your diet and things, you go back to your basal insulin. It's simple, mm -hmm. it's much, much cheaper because mm -hmm. it's only one sample. And mm -hmm. then, you, then you would potentially say, well, how am I going with my horse? And that's when you might test two hours after the bucket feed on purpose to see that your bucket feed isn't going to be driving this insulin up that might be damaging your horse's cells and its feet. Mm, okay, that's really interesting. Okay, um, so a related question. Then you've talked about um, you, you've talked about like ongoing testing of a horse with EMS. Do you, do you feel like you can cure EMS then? Kind yeah, of uh, yes, actually, um, I actually do, and I haven't had an EMS case that I've not been able to completely cure, at oh. least temporarily. And um, I do have one at, in our hospital um, who's a teaching horse. Um, she shall remain anonymous because. Um, <laughs> Um, once you know <laughs> she's a she's adorable little welsh section a and when we talk about horses living off nothing she almost does but i know she's not living off nothing of course i can see what she's eating but she's the the, the pony that would you put the molasses lick in the field of four horses and all of a sudden you know the pony comes in with a molasses all over a muzzle and uh, <laughs> She's the one that ate the sycamore seeds and because <clears throat> she, she eats anything and everything mm. and yeah. uh, She's better now, but uh, yeah. so some are a lot more difficult. But but even even with this little pony, we did we have um, been able to diet her and get her back to normal, and she does require constant vigilance. But many 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 other horses with EMS, most of them, you can actually get to the point where you can reset them, wow. and then your management can relax. We've got two other EMS ponies in our in our teaching herd where one of them in particular one of the classic ones where she she was one of those ones that didn't look that fast you know she even when we started losing weight you could even start seeing her ribs but she still had a crest but once we got rid of that crest then we were able to reset her metabolism and put her out literally 24 7 on pasture and she she goes wow. with the so she doesn't even have to um you know we don't have to worry about her as long as we never let that for her it's all about the crest monitoring and individual horses have different things babe it's the whole size of yeah thank you that's super helpful okay um so we did have a question about crests um so do you think that so on certain types of horses we know that crests are kind of more likely maybe for example spanish yeah. horses and also on um stallions um you know obviously more prone to putting on a crest are there certain types of horses whether it's a breed or whether it's you know a stallion or whatever that where you feel like it's acceptable for them to have a crest or, or is it always fat well i mean there's there's some elastic tissue in the nuchal ligament and it, but it is still fat um, right. and so we can't pretend it's not it's just you can't expect a stallion to not have a crest i mean it is mm. acceptable to a degree but I would advise stallion owners, particularly of, of native breeds, to keep an eye on that crest, mm. to test if it's nice and spongy or if it's getting firm. You know, we know what crests do when they when they accumulate more fat and they do get firm. It's also there's some evidence in the research that the fat in the crest is actually more metabolically active than in other areas. In humans, it's our it's our fat in our omentum, in our in our tummies. That's mm. why people with 
little beer bellies can often be more metabolically abnormal than people that are fat all over because okay. of different type of fat can be more metabolically active than others. And there's some evidence to say that that, that nuchal crest and the, the crest fat is, is more metabolically active in horses. So it's, an, it's, an, it's a fact of life that stallions will have more of a crest. And it is a fact of life that some animals will have more of a crest. But I, I deal more with EMS horses. And there is a, a group of EMS horses and ponies that really do retain this metabolically active fat in their crest. And it really is an absolute indicator, like, like Angel, our, our horse. She's, um, mm. she, her crest tells you everything you need to know about when she, when she is. And it would and I had to get rid of that crest to reset her metabolically as well. But if that crest starts to get firm, um, mm. we know that that time when we need to watch for laminitis, yeah. Mm, right, that's so interesting. I didn't know that about um, belly fat and people I love to watch that. Mm. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, um, so another question about older horses and fat distribution. So um, the question is, does body shape and fat distribution of older horses change? And what are normal changes and what are the sorts of changes that you would be worried about in terms of hormonal issues? Yeah, you know? it's actually a really good question because what what um, I've only talked about EMS and we know that there's another endocrine disease or another hormonal disease called Cushing's disease or PPID, pituitary mm -hmm. intermediate dysfunction, if you want to have a mouthful, but PPID that can also cause insulin dysregulation and, and laminitis. Mm -hmm. Now, okay. one of the, so, so you'll, you'll get, I am getting to the answer to the question. You might think I'm getting a bit off the track, but I'm not. So one of the key factors with PPID, one of the first signs before they even get really hairy is that they actually lose muscle mass. They have muscle atrophy. Right. So what you'll see in a horse with this, they tend to, it's a really high prevalence. Uh, 15 years and over, 21.2% of horses have PPID. That's one in five. So it's a really high prevalence. So watch them for that. So when their muscles atrophy, where their muscles were lovely and bulked up, they would have had a lovely, flat, rounded appearance like we see with, with our normal, well-padded horses that we have. Mm -hmm. However, when the muscle atrophies, the fat often looks quite lumpy and bumpy. And I'm, in the past, we used to call it fat redistribution. And I'll talk about that in one second, with, particularly mm. of the eyes and the okay. crest. It's even another really good hallmark for metabolic problems. Mm. But with PPID, the, when the muscles atrophy, their fat starts to look lumpy and bumpy, a little bit like cellulite in a person. Yeah. Mm. And so when you start to see all on the bottom and everything, so you will see, you, you see older horses that are a bit more lumpy, bumpy. Mm. And if that looks quite prominent, say, hang on a sec, has, has my horse lost the muscle underneath that fat? In which case, maybe I should get a PPID test because I've got muscle atrophy there, particularly if the back's looking a bit more suede, the mm. tummy's looking a bit more round, like a pot belly. Mm -hmm. Keep an eye on that. But the other point I was going to say is you can get specific um, fat redistribution. It's not quite the thing, um, thing with old age. Mm. Um, and you will get some horses can still be metabolically healthy and get a little bit more lumpy fat with old age. That's just the way mm. it is. It's the same in people, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so yes, it, it can be an indicator of PPID, but don't assume that your horse has PPID and that's it because it mm. might not be. The only other point I'll say about fat redistribution Mm. which is a sign of both EMS and PPID. The one that I find, not everybody agrees with me, but from my experience is where you get fat on the hollows above the eyes. Okay. That to me is a metabolically abnormal animal. And even to me, I would, if that was my horse, I'd test it for insulin dysregulation in a heart mm. is quick as a flash. Really? really? Okay. Oh, that's really interesting. That's a really simple indicator. Down. Mm. When they're eating right on the ground, obviously it's going to bulge because because of gravity. But when they're standing up, head up normally, if okay. the bulge is there instead of the hollow like it should be, okay. it's the orbital fossa, a fossa mean Latin for hole, isn't it? So, mm -hmm. so um, yes, if it's not a little cave and it's a little bulge, then that's a problem. Great. Okay, that's really interesting. Thank you. Okay, um, so uh, a question then about. What are the, so what about owners, owners' perceptions of fat? What would you say are the most common misperceptions or misconceptions that you see among owners about a horse's weight? Well, it's, it's, a, it's, it's probably more of an image thing. It's like, what shape should my horse be? And um, you can probably tell from my accent that I'm originally from Australia. And um, we, we do have probably more Arab bred ponies than straight mm. natives. Um, 
Australian saddlebook book ponies, Australian riding ponies and things, and, and uh, we do have a lot of Arab in them as well as Welsh, of course, as well. But I think the thing is, is that in, I think a lot of people get very um, convinced that their shape should be quite blocky and, and square, whereas mm. underneath all of those blocky ponies is a real horse shape. And I think, so from my perspective, the most common misconception is the wither. Right. So where you've got a very, very flat wither, mm. um, I think that that's, people don't see that as a fat accumulation. I think that mm. they think that's the horses, that they're somehow the muscles of grown up either side of the wither or their bones are a bit lower in that animal whereas mm. i think really in most cases it's fat accumulation around the dorsal spinous processes of the thoracic vertebrae if you want to know the okay interesting so you feel like we should be able to clearly see a wither in in nearly all horses yes. Yes. okay right okay oh that's fat interesting okay thank you very much okay um so last question we leave you to your day um so uh, obviously we know that your background's in um, exercise physiology so we were just wondering what sorts of exercise would you say is best for maximizing weight loss or fat burn? okay good well the question is maximizing mm. so um i will say before that that any form of exercise is better than none so um you know and i think you know i think with all this weight loss thing Exercise is a really nice, fun way of, you know, well, that's your research, Tamsin, but exercise is a really nice, fun way of, of having time with your horse and, and um, you know, losing weight without being difficult. And, and, you know, with all of my being strict and telling you about these horrible hormonal things, I do think that, that weight loss has to be something that's able to be incorporated into a yearly schedule of activities mm -hmm. and not something that's just a horrible burden on people because otherwise it's not fun for you it's not fun for the pony i'm very much a proponent of getting animals out so the first part of exercise is get them out into a field i'm also a proponent of having a, a well um grazed field as in what some people call bear but it's never bear check what um i have i have two two one acre i have two acres one acre is our home garden and the other acre is a field and i can tell you my field looks bare because it's got animals on it mm -hmm. and my home garden needs to be mown every week i can tell you what those animals are eating because i can see my compost heap getting bigger and bigger it's a <laughs> okay. heap now, and it was a brand new compost heap this year you know so so <laughs> anyway um so first thing if you put them on a bear field and make them work for a forage for their dinner that's the first mm -hmm. form of exercise the next form of exercise is, is is obviously walking and then but the main uh, the main principle we're talking about insulin dysregulation and the animals all animals including even us mm -hmm. are absolutely physiologically driven evolutionarily that if you glycogen deplete if you deplete the sugar in your muscle cells okay you will no matter how abnormal you are you will absolutely maximize your insulin sensitivity afterwards okay. so so endurance exercise so it needs to be but endurance exercise is actually a little bit faster in the horse than you might realize so when you're walking your horse up the road and up a small hill you'll probably start breathing heavily well i do anyway um <laughs> you might think that that's exercise for you but unfortunately the horse needs to, to really start to to use that glycogen it really needs to be trotting um freely or fast or uh, and that and or even cantering so moderate intensity exercise for a horse is actually canter exercise and faster believe it or not even pony, ponies are no different mm -hmm. so um moderate so if you read the research, it's moderate intensity exercise with periods of high intensity exercise will maximize your insulin sensitivity. But I don't want to make that difficult for people. If people think, okay, any exercise is good. Mm. And if I can burn away some of that excess energy in the muscles of my horse, it's going to mm. really help. And obviously they have to not have laminitis, etc. But good, you know, a good 30 minutes of trotting exercise without spending the whole time at a walk will be really, really good and really, really healthy for a horse. So that's right. what I would say is, is I'd keep that as the baseline. Great. Okay. So well, thank you, Snip. Wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's brilliant. Thank you. Okay. Um, that's covered all the questions we had here. Was there anything else that you wanted to add before we let you get on? Yes. Board? Well, I just wanted to say that, that kind of how I prefaced the answer to that question was, mm. I think, um, you know, wait, 
we've got a lot of, I've got three native ponies in my teaching herd and even some of the non-native ponies, even ex-police horses can be quite difficult to maintain um, nice slim body sizes. Mm. I think we, from my perspective, what I'd like people to understand is not all fat is going to lead your horse to laminitis, although all fat will make your horse have more pressure on its joints and its respiratory system. So okay. you don't think it's not going to be innocuous. It's always a problem, but mm. you've got more time when you're not metabolically abnormal. So my first point, just to summarise, is why not know if your horse is metabolically abnormal or not? Because then at least you'll know if you've got to sort of be really, really strict or take your time, take it, you know, just be consistently good, I guess is probably more the point. Mm -hmm. The other point is, is that all weight loss, I think really needs to be, um, uh, you know, weight control needs to be managed in, an, in an, a way that works for each individual person. And again, I guess that's your, your side, not mine. And from my perspective as, as a vet that sees a lot of EMS cases, if you've got a little bit of time, if your horse is not laminitis at the moment, and if it's, mm. even if it's metabolically at, in, um, abnormal use winter weight loss use the seasons remember what why they've evolutionarily come like this in the first place it was because they were designed to be like on the shetland islands or in the hills of wales where they didn't get feed for three months a year you know let them drop the weight over the winter let them reset so, so i guess that was my point let them Mm. try to reset your animal whether that's a period of dieting not forever don't diet don't be strict i think a period of strict dieting where you can relax reset them whether mm. that you use winter or whether or not you do that as a diet is is up to the to the person mm. and um and work it work, get use exercise and work it into your daily routine and make it fun for everybody Brilliant. Okay. That's so helpful. So we should be just allowing winter to help us with that, allowing our horses to ideally see their ribs in spring. And then that helps us to reset them, like you said. Let them reset their metabolic because that's what that's how they survived in, in the past. Let them reset their metabolic um, or their metabolism mm -hmm. over the winter. Yeah, let them come out of the winter showing the ribs. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Oh, fantastic. Thank you very much. Right. Well, I'll turn off this recording, but thank you. Um, that's um. Okay, awesome. thank you everyone. Hopefully we have kept everyone and we still have Sue's, so that's good. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed that interview. I certainly learned a lot from it. Okay. Yeah, so shall we get started with we've got some questions already um so guys if you do have more questions just pop them in the chat and we'll try and get through all of them um shall i start off okay right so we have a question from maxine um she says of my my not overweight mare has been diagnosed with ems she had laminitis during the not cold but really wet and muddy winters recently could they get laminitis through being stressed what's your take on that so can stress be a, a factor i guess with stress we know you're going to get raised corticosteroid levels in the circulation whether or not that's sufficient i don't know um i think it's an interesting question and i don't really know that there's any scientific evidence to support that hypothesis. Um, one really needs to look at corticosteroid levels in a variety of horses under a variety of different conditions, I think, to be able to scientifically answer that question. Yes, definitely. And I think it's probably sort of um, how do you, yeah, as you say, how do you measure that stress and how do you sort of standardize the conditions under which you measure the stress um, between different horses? Yeah, which is, which is pretty difficult to do, I think. Um, I think there have been lots of studies that have looked, for example, at corticosteroids under a variety of different circumstances. And we know that there are so many variable factors that can influence the amount of circulating corticosteroids that making any conclusions of cause and effect is extraordinarily difficult. Yeah, and I suppose sort of with... Um... Uh, Maxine mentioned sort of the not cold winters, which we seem to be getting more and more of these winters where it's not quite cold, but we get a lot of rain and sort of the grass doesn't stop growing, um, which probably doesn't help. No, no, I, I think we have to move away from thinking that laminitis is 
possibly a, a summer or spring, summer, autumn related problem. I think if we see a change in the, in the wind, weather during the winter, we can get sudden spurts in grass growth, which have an equally detrimental effect potentially. So I think we have to go away from thinking that we don't need to worry about laminitis in the winter months. I think, still think we have to be extremely vigilant. Okay, thank you. Um, so a second question, um, I often see a lot of discussion about this, particularly in barefoot horses. Um, is it possible for horses, so um, you were talking a lot about subclinical laminitis, are there other types of foot soreness, so footiness and so on, um, that could be caused by other things than, or is it, would you say that's generally caused by subclinical laminitis when the horse appears kind of footy and in, in, like a little bit sore on, on stones, for example, where it's not normally? Oh, <laughs> there are lots of different reasons. Um, but some horses have inherently thinner soles than others. Some of those soles are more compressible and therefore they transmit forces through to the sensitive tissues. Whereas other horses have a very thick solar surface, which doesn't transmit those forces. And then you can have low grade um, soft tissue injuries within the hoof capsule, for example, various ligament structures within the hoof, and the foot is slightly imbalanced on uneven ground and the horse is uncomfortable. So there are many, many different reasons. So I think the footy horse is a big umbrella diagnosis without being in any way specific for the underlying cause of pain. It just tells you that this horse is uncomfortable and yeah. you need to find out why. Okay, thank you. Okay, Steve. Right, so we go on. So we have a question from Stacy, or actually two questions. So let's take tackle them one at a time. So the first one: for easy keeper horses with excess weight that are not getting any feed, is it better to increase exercise versus limiting hay and or grass access? So what's better? Shall we sort of try and? increase their exercise or kind of reduce their feed? I think it's probably a combination. Um, <laughs> uh, if the grass is good, why are you feeding hay as well? I don't think that's necessary. Um, but it always has to be balanced with exercise. So I strongly believe that many horses are under-exercised, um, perhaps because we have less lack of time, but we need to exercise horses more, if at all possible. Um, and... When I look at the local leisure horse population um, in my vicinity, I see that many people only ride them at the walk. And I think, why aren't they doing more? They could trot, they could even canter. Um, we heard from Kathy, and I thought it was very interesting that we hadn't in any way consulted about what I was going to talk about or what she was going to sort of talk about, but it was very much coming at things from the same angle. We yeah. need these horses to exercise. But at the same time, we have to limit what they can eat. Um, and if there's adequate grass, they certainly don't need hay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we've, we've got two questions. Um, one, uh, two questions which are about obesity in specific types of horses. So the ones that have been mentioned are Mustangs and um, heavy horses. So in your opinion, are there, are there differences in um, obesity in different types of horses? So would you manage a heavy horse, for example, or a Mustang or a Shetland pony any differently? Or is it the same, um, the same kind of makeup and the same issues, regardless of breed? No, I think we know, and as uh, Cathy mentioned, there is a genetic predisposition, which in part is breed related, mm -hmm. um, but is exclusive to the breed. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no doubt that, for example, the cob types are at risk. Um, but I don't think one can necessarily make sweeping generalizations across the board. Um, I will profess I know nothing about Mustangs, except I know that they are, there are probably too many of them in the USA. Um, I don't know if there's any literature related to Mustangs. Um, either you, Townsend or Dee may know better than I do in that respect. Um, so I, I claim complete ignorance about Mustangs. <laughs> yeah, I can't. In sort of off the top of my head, I can't think of any research that has been done specifically in Mustangs. I know they've sort of looked at quarter horses, um, standard breads, um, so, um, sort of I think Missouri fox trotters maybe. I'm, I'm not too up to date with sort of the American breeds. Um, 
but nothing about Mustangs. Yeah, I would say the same. I've seen quarter horses, but not Mustangs as well. Sorry, just to go back to um, our previous question, um, I think this that sort of comes up quite a bit and about kind of supplementary feeding. And yes, while I think sort of giving bucket feed and unnecessary concentrates and so on is a problem, I think a lot of people don't consider actually how much nutrition their horses are getting just from hay and grass. Um, and I think that's something that's maybe come across, for example, I think in a couple of studies where they've looked at risk factors for um, laminitis or uh, obesity, they've actually found that obese horses are less likely to get bucket feeds. And that's probably because they are in the condition they are and owners are maybe not giving them bucket feeds, but are perhaps not limiting their forage intake adequately. And I think, Sue, you did a really good comparison sort of showing that pony that is meant to be getting fed six kilograms of hay a day, but was getting 16 kilograms, sort of eight kilograms twice a day. So I think we may might think, oh, well, hay isn't very nutritious, but actually that kind of where most of our horses are getting their energy and calories from. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I, I think that the, the general public is misinformed about what horses need. And I think that there's a huge amount of pressure from the feed companies to encourage people to feed more when perhaps all they need is a small balancer in order to make sure they have the adequate um, base elements as it were, but they don't need extra carbohydrates or protein levels. Um, and I, I do feel that the feed companies should take um, a better, uh, a more ethical route to what they promote to the horse owner. Yeah. That's, um, yeah, that would be great to see, especially, as you say, from some of sort of the adverts. I'm not going to sort of name any feed company specifically, but, you know, um, showing relatively overweight horses as, you know, being in good condition and promoting their feed. So definitely that would be nice to yeah. see. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've got a really interesting question from uh, Di. Is a hard crest likely to be painful for a horse? I've never seen any evidence that it's painful, no. Um, and I don't think that fat people say that their, their omentum is painful either. <laughs> well, probably not, that's good. <laughs> okay. Okay, sorry. So this is the second part of Stacy's question. So she was asking, if forage reduction is most beneficial, would the reduction of weight outweigh the potential for ulcers and stall vices caused by limiting forage? Um, my opinion would unquestionably would be, be yes. Um, I think it is absolutely fundamental that they reduce weight. I think that there is only limited evidence to suggest that they may increase in stable vices or gastric ulceration. I think we should be able to provide them with other entertainment and it doesn't, by, by reducing their forage intake, it doesn't mean we're, we're taking them out of a pasture, we're just limiting their access, be it by mowing the grass, by strip grazing them, by putting muzzles on. I think there are lots of alternative ways of doing it or a combination thereof. Uh, and I think that with appropriate management and having companions and having also toys that they can play with, they should not be unduly stressed by this. Uh, and I know that this can be successfully done because I have put animals on, on incredibly restricted diets and they have done really, really well as a result of that without developing any secondary problems. Uh, and I think that we tend to um, overestimate the consequences of dietary restriction, perhaps because we anthropomorphize thinking that we would be hungry, we would be irritable or whatever. And that's actually not the case. Um, I think animals can adapt remarkably well to huge dietary restrictions. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. 
Uh, oh, sorry, just, Tamsin. You go. I was just going to add, um, if um, the person who asked that question wanted, we, we've talked a bit in um, a, particularly the webinar with Claire McLeod, who is a nutritionist, um, about ways to if you use really low calorie forage, if it's something you're particularly worried about with a horse, um, using, for example, sometimes chopped straw as forage and those sorts of things to keep your horse entertained if you're really worried about that or using different types of hay nets so that some will take them longer to eat and so on. Um, and, and also different ways of using enrichment as well. So just um, as a kind of follow on to what Sue said and agreeing with her, there are some specific examples of things that you can do um, if you're interested in our previous um, webinars, which are recorded. Cool, let's see. Um, we had a question uh, from Lenovo asking about whether you have any advice Sue, about what to do when people are keeping multiple horses together and they have different needs. So if you're keeping a skinny old horse with a fat, <laughs> fat younger horse, for example, um, do you have advice for how people manage that? Well, I think that's tough, particularly if they're sharing pasture, it becomes pretty well impossible. <laughs> and I know even when horses have been split into separate pastures, there are so-called do-gooders on the yard who think that animal isn't getting enough to eat. So they give it more contrary to the advice and expectations of the owner. And I know that there have been some major fallouts between people as a result of this, understandably so. Um, so I think that you, you probably need to get an outside person in to talk to everybody about the best ways of managing the individuals as a group accepting that it is impossible i think to manage them all on the same pasture they've got to be treated as individuals mm -hmm. um, yeah. that means some of them coming in for a while so be it but they have to be treated as individuals i'm afraid mm -hmm. i know it kind of complicates the issue but that's how it has to be yeah absolutely i sympathize with this poster because i did have a um ancient thoroughbred mare with a young welsh cob um and they were really attached to each other so it had to be together and it was rough but <laughs> so i had to do things like having the uh, welsh cob in really hard work and you know separating them for the parts of the day and so on but yeah you you have to manage the weight don't you you can't just you you can't just let it go <laughs> because it's difficult it's really tough yeah okay over to you Dee. oh Right. This is, I think this is a really good question. So from Sarah, she said, could hoof pain present as a lazy or lethargic horse? Um, her horse has been on a steady weight loss plan and increased exercise for several months, but still has no enthusiasm for work. So what could sort of contribute to a horse not <laughs> well, being enthusiastic? Uh, I very strongly believe, and I think we've got an increasing body of evidence to support this, that I don't think they are genuinely lazy and lethargic horses. I think most lazy and lethargic horses have some underlying pain related problem. Um, and I can't say specifically where the pain may be coming from. It may be foot pain, it may be back pain, it may be hind limb pain, but the lethargic horse, mm -hmm. the lazy horse generally has underlying musculoskeletal pain. And I know from observing these horses ridden that if I can take away their pain, by applying nerve blocks to the limbs on a temporary basis, you immediately see a transformation in their attitude towards work. So I know that their attitude is a cause and effect. Pain causes them to be uncomfortable and therefore they do not want to work. And I think that there has been over the years a conditioning of the horse owning public that there are lazy horses. And I think that this arises in part because most of us learnt to ride at riding schools where there is unfortunately a high proportion of horses which have some degree of musculoskeletal pain. So they are grumpy. They don't want to go forwards very willingly. They make ideal riding school horses because they don't want to go very fast. But then we become conditioned that these are normal behaviours for horses. And I would like people to think outside that box and say these are not normal behaviours. We have to understand that these are ways in which the horse is trying to communicate with us that it is uncomfortable. And then we, it's our duty to try and find out why it's uncomfortable. Yeah. And just as a quick diversion, going into sort of saddle fit, because I think that's a really sort of interesting area, especially when we have horses that do lose weight. So what would you recommend to sort of like the ideal space, um, 
duration between which you should have your saddle checked. For example, if your horse has suddenly lost 50 or 60 kilograms over a couple of months, you know, is it advisable to have the saddle rechecked? And then going forward, how often should we be looking to check that saddle? That, that's a very good question. Um, we did do a study when we followed um, about 140 horses every two months over a year, measuring their back dimensions and relating their change in dimensions to the season, their work histories, whether or not they had musculoskeletal problems, whether or not they'd had a recent saddle fit change. And we know that there are measurable changes in back dimensions within two months within many horses. So I think if the horse has lost weight considerably, then its saddle fit needs to be readdressed after that weight loss. And then we need to be rechecking that saddle fit at an absolute minimum of every six months. And I think six months are always appropriate for any horse. Um, and if you're continuing to see changes in shape, then you need to continue to have a more regular saddle fit check. And I think this is enormously important for the horse's comfort and the appropriate development of the back muscles and the horse's overall comfort and way, way of moving. And I think that saddle fit has been something that has been hugely underestimated in its potential influence on equine welfare and performance. Um, it, but just think about yourself wearing a shoe that's uncomfortable. You wouldn't tolerate mm. what we expect the horse to do, have a clothes peg around its back, for example, because of tight tree points in the saddle. Um, it is a very, very important issue that's sadly overlooked. Yeah, definitely. And I think if, if we're also kind of um, advising people that we want to see the seasonal weight, you know, we want to see the horses losing weight over winter, you know, resetting their metabolism and then leaving a little bit of space for some weight gain when the grass comes through, then definitely if they're going to be changing shape, you know, between winter than every six months the mm -hmm. absolute minimum does make sense then mm -hmm. over to you Tamsin actually just a, a follow-up question if that's okay on that and um, because we we also um uh, often talk about saddle fit of very fat horses and when people are trying to exercise them but they're almost too fit for too fat for any saddle and the issues that people face at that point and then saddles moving and slipping all the time and so on um, and given that that's your area of expertise um, and <laughs> it'd be a shame not to ask you do you have any advice for people in that situation where they're finding it really hard to get saddles that sit comfortably because the horse is so fat and obviously they can't exercise it without riding particularly <laughs> Um, I, I think it's a difficult situation because there's no doubt that the rounder the horse is back, the more likely the saddle is to rotate from side to side. And if the back of the saddle is rotating from side to side, that's going to influence the whole movement of the saddle and the way the front of the saddle will bang up against the spinous processes, which is going to create discomfort for the horse. But there's no magical cure. I think if you work with a good saddle fitter, and work with a variety of different girth settings, you can improve the situation in some horses. Mm. Um, and uh, it is very much a matter of trial and error with different saddle types. Mm. I have huge empathy because it's just a, a matter of biomechanics that the rounder the horse is, the more likely the saddle is to move, unfortunately. Mm. And then you have these horses with these um, big abdomens and thoraxes and then you the girth groove is too far forwards which tends to drag the saddle forwards mm -hmm. and then the saddle impinges on the movement of the scapulae the shoulder blades which in itself is a problem um, so the whole issue of the big fat horse the position of its girth groove um, we can't physically change the shape of the horse we just have to accommodate the saddle fit as best we can. And there are some saddle fitters who are better at doing this than others, in my experience. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a question of saying you need to use X brand of saddle or X brand of girth. You have to use what is best for that particular individual horse. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, we've got some more questions. How are, you, how are you for time, Sue? I don't know. We've got a lot of questions, so we might have to cut Ooh, off. Oh, gosh, it's so fast already. At, at some point. Um, are you happy to do one or two more? Or? 
Yeah, one or two more. Yeah, okay, <laughs> thank you. We don't want to keep you all evening. Um, okay, this one uh, probably won't take too long. Um, Shirley says she stopped feeding her horse supplements for weight loss but the ho because the, the horse is out 24 seven um, on not much grass, uh, but the horse's behavior has increasingly worsened. She's very jumpy and nervous. Um, could it be down to lacking vitamins, uh, vit uh, vitamins and minerals um, from not having those supplements? So do you advise supplements for horses that are dieting or balances? Um, I do advise a balancer, yes. Um, I always advise a balancer, mm -hmm. but I don't have any evidence that the presence or absence of a balancer alters behaviour profoundly. Mm -hmm. um, been some work looking at magnesium and the effect it, it might have on behaviour, and I think the, the evidence is pretty shaky. Um, nervousness and anxiety, I would always think, is there some other cause of mm -hmm. discomfort? that may be creating that behavior that would worry me more personally than mm -hmm. um, an imbalance of vitamins or minerals right mm. yeah i agree i do see that a lot i think we're conditioned to think about feed when we see any problem in our horse so because then we think is there a supplement that we can give that kind of fixes it and obviously it's absolutely sometimes about feed but we you know a lot a lot else goes on in our horses lives doesn't it so yeah <laughs> yeah i'd agree on that um d do you want to Oh, yeah, so we've got one. Yes, sorry, one more. Uh, we've got one about corticosteroids here. Mm. So specifically for, for the part on corticosteroids and its connection to laminitis, what steps for a vet's point of view do you think is responsible to maybe head off the chance of inducing laminitis? Um, well, whenever I'm contemplating giving corticosteroids, I will always look at the body condition score of the horse. And if the horse has a very high body condition score, I'll be thinking, can I use something other than corticosteroids to treat whatever I am attempting to treat? So if, for example, I wanted to give an intra-articular injection, that is an injection into the joint, is there another product that I could use which is not corticosteroids? And yes, I could use IRAP, or I could use um, the new Beringer stem cell preparation, more expensive considerably, um, but probably far, far less risky, or I could inject Hyaluronan or perhaps Aliquan. Um, so I'm always thinking, is there an alternative treatment that I can use other than corticosteroids? If the answer is no, I need to use corticosteroids, I'm then going to think, well, what's the lowest dose that I could possibly use that may have a therapeutic effect and not have a likelihood of endangering the horse? Um, so the, the, those are my baseline guidelines to myself and therefore guidelines which I would give to anybody else. I have been guilty, I know. I treated a horse which um, had COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, or recurrent airway dis, um, dysfunction. Um, and I know that the result of the dexamethasone that I gave it, I'm absolutely sure, induced laminitis in that pony. Um, we've all, we will all face that experience when we've, made a judgment call and the judgment call turn, turns out to be wrong but we almost was also, also always warn the clients about the relative risks and it's a risk it's a kind of risk benefit analysis which we're carrying out all the day all the time with many of the things that we're doing and sometimes we just have to say there is a risk but i think that the benefits outweigh the risks it becomes a judgment call but it's important from my perspective as a veterinarian that I have informed the owner of the potential risks. So ultimately they can agree or not agree that we go ahead with this. And I'm going to also advise them what they need to be looking for if they are not familiar with a horse which may have signs of laminitis. Okay, thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, well, right. we should probably leave it there, which feels, I'm really sorry for everybody who hasn't had their questions answered. Um, we'll try and answer the ones that um, D and I are, uh, our areas are kind of around management and so on, so we can chat with you um, about that on the Facebook page. There are some specifically about um, hoof 
uh, hoof balance and radiographs and so on. Um, and we do have next week's webinar, we'll, um, we will have a farrier who um, is an expert in this area talking about laminitis and um, what, what's going on in the hooves. Um, and, um, and also a vet talking about what exactly what happens between a horse getting fat and, and how that then translates into all these other problems and so on. Um, so there will be a chance to ask more questions there. Sorry, we always have so many questions for our experts. We unfortunately yeah. can't always cover them all, but we'll do our best. <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you so much, Sue. Uh, it was lovely having you here and a really, really interesting talk. And yeah, I mean, we could probably spend all night discussing the different aspects of it, um, but we know you're very, very busy. Uh, so we will let you go. Okay, many thanks indeed. Yeah. Thank thanks you so very much. much. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Have a nice evening. Bye. Bye, Bye. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.